Hi everyone, thanks for coming to the Member Series tonight. Uh, member Series is a public event at Green where resident members, mostly grad students, share their research or topic in their field of study. Uh, I'd like to begin the event by acknowledging that the land on which we gather tonight is the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Muslim people. Yeah, and more people are coming. Yes, uh, and I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker, Merlene. Merlene is a PhD candidate in applied mathematics at UBC. Merlene has diverse academic backgrounds, not limited to mathematics, which includes engineering, computer science, and theoretical physics. Before his PhD, he obtained multiple research experiences from German Aerospace Center, University of Chicago, and Max Planck Institute for Plasma Physics. Uh, in today's talk, Meline will talk about recovering pattern formation in cell systems with some background information to understand this topic. Uh, according to Meline, uh, all we need to understand today's talk is our openness to mathematics. So without further ado, uh, please uh, join me in welcoming Meline. Very nice. <laughs> Thank you, Yung Sok, for the great introduction. Um, we have a big agenda today, so uh, we will have uh, four sections or three sections of uh, um, different things we, we first need to maybe work up to and uh, need to understand before going to the research, so before understanding what, what uh, I'm researching on. Um, I'm, uh, as, as Jung Sun said, a PhD uh, candidate in applied mathematics at uh, UBC in the Institute of Applied Mathematics for the people who don't know me from the dining hall, so right here. Um, and I'm maybe giving a quick disclaimer on, on what I'm saying today, which is that the mathematics I'm saying is maybe a little bit hand wavily formulated uh, for maybe people watching from YouTube at the moment, maybe you are up there uh, in, in this camera. Um, but nevertheless, because this is, a, this is a public talk and this is my choice of, of saying these words, nevertheless, the, the mathematical words should be precise and also what is behind these words should be always precise and I re can refine if this is uh, needed. Perfect. So let's go to the first uh, section of the play. And this will be on... At first, uh, maybe some of you were here already uh, of my, uh, for my uh, first talk here in Green College, which, which is here the second uh, item. Right? These, these are all the research talks I was holding, uh, no, research I was conducting in, in, in my life. And last time I did the second, um, the presentation of the second point, so numerical methods of plasma physics. Some of you were here already, like uh, Rico and Michael. Um, and now I'm focusing on the symmetry breaking in cell systems, so cells which are coupled in a, in a diffusion field with each other. Okay. So this will have at first an introduction to what, what mathematics is, right? This is kind of a big thing uh, because mathematics is huge, right? it has many different branches. But in order for you to understand how, how big this field is, um, I'm, I'm showing a few things. I'm showing a website and, and a few different pictures. Um, then I'm going to introduce you to the mathematical proof, which is the main um, uh, work tool for, for mathematics in order to understand if what the idea you're having is actually true. Right? This is not always the case, of course. It's, it's very often not the case. And uh, I'm giving you preliminaries to, to understanding the fourth point, which are going to be the last 10 minutes of this talk. So basically, the first 40 minutes are preparation of the last 10 minutes of, of this talk. Okay. So overview. Modern mathematics. And here's a funny picture. Um, copyrighted by this person right here. This is a very nice picture I found in the internet. Um, probably not the best one, but uh, one can draw, but the best one I found. Um, <laughs> so, 
So you can't really see much, right, because it's so, uh, uh, I think, pixely. But maybe you can see the, the big um, uh, uh, things, like pure mathematics and here and here. Algebraic, um, algebra with, with linear algebra and then group theory, right? Group theory is, is a subfield of mathematics. Uh, can you see this? What, what is here? Perfect. Um, then geometry, right? So, so shapes and, and uh, algebraic geometry also this is related to each other. Algebra is the study of um, algebraic structures like, like groups, monoids, vector spaces, and so on. And this, this consists of uh, having a set of numbers and then operations on these numbers and inverse elements, right? So it kind of makes intuitively sense that when you give or add something, that doing the inverse action of subtracting something should be inside this, this whole, uh, 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 inside a so-called group or inside any structure we, we want to uh, work with, right? So that it makes sense to work with this. Okay. This is what algebra is, is, is uh, um, or people in algebra are studying. Uh, topology is the study of uh, basically how many holes an object has. So how it's related, how, how objects with uh, a certain amount of holes uh, are, uh, are different and, and finding also um, uh, topology of your data structure and so on. So everything kind of is connected with each other and also connected to new branches like uh, theoretical machine learning. I'm uh, situated uh, in changes, right? In dynamical systems, everything which changes over time, which is basically everything in this world, right? To a certain time scales. Even a stone is changing in, in time of, of uh, millions of years and so on, but maybe we don't care so much about looking at a stone as a dynamical system, right? Um, chaos theory is related to when, when a butterfly is flapping uh, its wings in Taiwan, uh, that this can cause a tornado in Kansas. So um, the mathematical notion of chaos, um, which, which is closely connected what, to, to what we maybe call chaos in the, in the language sense, is sensitive dependence on initial conditions. So flapping slightly changes the initial conditions and mixing, so the mixing property of the weather, right? Okay, then, um, yeah, then we can, of course, also have some probability inside uh, everything which is maybe alive, has some probabilistic um, uh, behavior. This is very much connected to biomathematics where I'm also situated in um, and everything is, of course, also physical, right? Everything is connected. And I would like you to see really the connectedness of everything completely. And, and uh, the, the lines here are only the lines of the, basically uh, the person who draw, drew the lines in, in this, for this diagram. Okay. So now I found a math map. So of the Quanta magazine, which is very interesting, a very interesting magazine which posts yearly uh, breakthroughs in biology and in, in physics, in mathematics, and it's, it's a very, very, very top and, and inspiring magazine um, um, because many, many famous researchers post there, are many researchers you don't really know about, but they, they uh, did some pioneering research, they did the biggest breakthroughs of, of, of the last few years, and uh, this is what they usually focus on. And they implemented a math map, um, and here they separated mathematics in, in three different fields, right? What they mean with numbers is uh, number theory, so, so prime numbers and so on, for example. Um, shapes geometry, right? So differential geometry flows on, on some abstract shapes, maybe this, which is your data or what, what, whatsoever. Does not have to be physical shapes. Any, any, any thought process <laughs> maybe has something to do with a math mathematical object, right? Um, and then change, and change denotes dynamical system. Um, 
Yes, and when we scroll down a little bit to see what they implemented, we see at first numbers, so algebra, and then we see here what is written down on the top right. So I'll just give a quick introduction on this website, and you can, if you're interested, see further here in the map of mathematics what, what they put in there. This is, of course, not a complete map, because math is so massive, developed by thousands and millions of people over the last many, many, many years, uh, also thousands of years. Um, and uh, what accumulated are all this knowledge we have proven to be correct based on assumptions. Okay. These are the prime numbers, and they are going on to infinity. Then we can here go maybe, maybe one more picture, where there's a numerical iteration finding Euler's number, and Euler's number is, is connected to um, the solutions you get for partial differential equations, and this you will find inside your solution. So this is gamma E, usually you would see, but people in, in math, of course, they, they don't know Euler's number, but this is just an iteration how to get a better, 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 better approximation of the number row by row. And I don't really, I have not really understood uh, what every row means. So it could be, and when we talked about this, uh, that the lines are the first approximation, and then with each line, the length of the line are a better approximation. But I would have to look into this a little bit more. Right? Okay. Now, when we are going to the map, we see all these topics, and here numbers. So algebra, shapes, differential geometry, geometry, change, dynamical systems, passages, also is a new one, uh, are here connected with each other. Um, and here we see well, what, is, what is maybe nice, is a nice picture. This is connected to dynamical systems. Um, a very nice animation. It's just an animation. You, you cannot really make sense of it if you don't have an application in mind at the moment. Okay. And uh, then three-body problem, maybe this is interesting to see. So what is this? Attraction and collision, right? Bodies bumping into each other. This is all mathematics. Okay. Then um, graph theory. So maybe you've uh, uh, heard of graphs really being very related to, to many, many uh, 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 structures we have in, in our also human societies, maybe social networks and so on, are uh, 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 graphs also. And you can model more and more and more different things with graphs. And this is being in the process of recovered at the moment. And here at each time step, a new node is being inserted in the network and then randomly with a certain uh, number between 0 and 1, 100% means 100, uh, uh, one, 1 means 100%, it's connected to the other nodes. Right? That's a very simple version of a graph. And again, you have to relate this to some application, maybe, or you can study it abstractly so that the application can be found after. Okay. Brownian paths are random motions, and this is not really a Brownian path, though, because here you kind of only go vertically, horizontally, and diagonally, and Brownian paths are um, uh, characterized as you can go in 2D space, as this is 2D, everywhere, in, in each direction, and not a, sing, a specified length of a time, of a, of a step in a certain time interval. Okay. Then we go back to the presentation, and you can look around. There are also many different exercises you can do and really see what you can change uh, when uh, typing certain things into this website. Okay. Then I'm opening this with a different viewer, and we now go to the mathematical proof. Right. So when we have a conjecture in math, when we have an idea or when we have an intuition about something, uh, it may be that our intuition is totally wrong. Um, and we, we discover this every week. Every mathematician discovers 
every week a tiny bit that something is wrong, or every day even um, that something is wrong, and we need a certain structure to, to um, which is which has already been set up and proven, and is revisited once in a while again uh, in order to recover if if uh, something is true and uh, recover the, uh, the next steps, because sometimes we don't know where we are going, but we are going step by step by step with these mathematical tools, and we don't know where we are ending up sometimes. When we end up at a very important result, then it changes mathematics, maybe, so that it changes where we can go to, not the foundations, um, and it changes biological sciences, for example, or, or more. Okay. So, the first example, I just give you one example of, of a mathematical proof, um, is this monotone convergence theorem. And first, let's understand what this is actually saying. So, if a sequence of real numbers, so let's say maybe the sequence is called an, and n is in the natural number, so, one, so 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. So, what this is basically is a symbol for these are all symbols for certain numbers, right? And so on. This goes to infinity. Infinity many pieces uh, is increasing. So all these things are increasing and bounded above. So if I now draw here a little uh, coordinate system with n, here's 0, here's our first sequence element, second, third, and so on. And this is a n, then we are increasing, but we are bounded above at the same time, so it could look, this is an example of course, but it should look something like this, right? So we are increasing, 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 but we are leveling off because we are still bounded. Okay, so now I put this line here, and uh, maybe I put this Right here, this is the axis, and this line is at C. Right? I just call, call this, this number C. And uh, let C be the smallest number, which is bigger than every element here in the sequence, where the sequence is increasing, increasing, increasing. The smallest number, where we are bigger than the largest, when we're going to infinity. So this is called the supremum. So, and what this theorem is saying, that we are precisely converging when we are going to infinity, and uh, infinity we can uh, come very, or we can very fast come to an infinite limit um, um, based on convergence speed of a certain sequence. So we, we, are, we are close to a, to a limit uh, depending on our convergence speed, but it, what the theory is saying that we are ending up, no matter which convergence speed, at this precise supremum, at this least element bigger or equal than our biggest element in this whole sequence. Okay, So this proof uh, builds with uh, uh, or deals with a number we had just introduced, which is epsilon. So when we subtract a tiny number, we subtract something which is bigger than zero, then uh, we are always bumping into this uh, line and we are uh, uh, um, above this, this line C minus epsilon at a certain n. We can always find this n, right? Otherwise, C would not be the supremum. Not the least element bigger or equal than everything. So what this is saying, this theorem, is when we shift this line upward by making epsilon tinier and tinier and tinier and tinier, we, are, we can prove because the real numbers we have in our world, we, in our, our world is basically R3, so a three-dimensional uh, 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 space of real numbers, because between every single two points, there are infinitely many points. Also between every two fractions, there are infinitely many real, real numbers, uh, which is, this is called the completeness, and we are working with that completeness in order to see that we are actually approaching this C. Okay. So at first, we, we know this already, the AN, right? Let's 
this B is such a sequence and, and uh, now um, it's non-empty in this sequence because it's increasing and therefore we know that it's non-empty, it's bounded above. Okay, due to the completeness of our real numbers, what I just explained, right, there, there, it's basically uh, this, this space is filled and uh, things are converging to, to certain things, right, but we are, we are trying to prove that this is at the moment the case. Uh, there exists this supremum, right, and this is finite of our sequence because it's bounded above. Then, for every such epsilon, there exists an n, so that we are breaking out of this line. Yeah. When we subtract something from the, big, from the least number bigger than, than the biggest number of our sequence, then we can always find an index where we break out. Okay. Otherwise, c minus epsilon would be the supremum, so the upper bound, which is not the case. Okay, so it contradict. Then, for every small n greater than this big N, we have, by, by um, putting this a n on this side, epsilon on this side, c minus a n, smaller epsilon. Actually, we don't need here the absolute values because c is bigger than a n for all the n's, right? So we are sandwiched now between zero. This is what the absolute value also makes this to be, it's, it's, and also C is always bigger than a n. It's sandwiched between zero and an epsilon. And therefore, when we make epsilon be tiny, 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 tiny number, just above zero, and this is a strictly, this has to be zero. And now we've proven that our sequence, and this is what this means, has the limit C. So this is a mathematical proof, and this is highly, highly important uh, to, to have such kind of proofs inside mathematics in order to understand that our results we are claiming to be true are actually true. Okay. Now let's go to the, let's see at the time. Okay. Uh, preliminaries to my research, and for this at first, uh, let's uh, talk about derivatives, and then second derivatives, um, if you've not already seen what, what this is. So, to a function, uh, the derivative, so the function has a domain which is basically every x you can plug into, maybe this, this domain is from minus m to m, and we say that this function is differentiable at a point a if an open interval is, connect, is, is inside our domain, right? We, we need this open interval in order to make sense of this plus h, otherwise we would step out of this interval. Then a function is differentiable at this point a, so that if this fraction, the limit of this fraction exists. So what, what does this actually mean here? So when I'm drawing here a quadratic function, then I draw here a, a plus h. Here I'm choosing h to be a positive number. Don't have to do this. This is x, this is f of x. This here is f of a, right? And then here we are at f of a plus h, right? So now we see what are we actually computing here. We are computing the slope of this line connecting these two points, right? That's what, that's what we are computing. Now, when we take the limit, we go further and further and further and further to this a, so that we are going to be infinitesimally small at this point a. We also, at the same time, go down here, so that this distance is zero, becomes zero, and this becomes zero, but the fraction between these two zero distances are what the slope precisely at this point A, right? So this is precisely this slope. This is what the derivative is, and it's denoted as, as f prime of A, or d dx f of A, um, and so on. So now if, if I choose here f of x equals x squared, uh, then f prime of x is 2x, 
and f double prime, so the second, if you do it again with this linear function, which is 2x with slope 2, is 2. So it has a positive slope. And uh, here we also, we, we can actually prove that this, when we revisit this idea of a proof, right, we always have to prove what we are writing down here. Otherwise, we can claim anything. Then we plug a plus h inside. We subtract a squared, and then we see that the, when we multiply this out, that the a squared cancels. We get a minus 2ah plus h squared divide by this h, let the limit go to infinity, and we see we are getting 2a. That's, that's the proof. Okay. Then these two things, are so the dx and df inside this notation is very much reminding us about this limit, that these are two, two are, are t basically numbers which are uh, going to zero, right? Is this uh, in the denominator and in the numerator, these are called differentials. A differential equation is an equation which involves at least two differentials. Okay. And here's an example of a, such a differential equation where we see that we have a slope in time, a time derivative. And there's a, and, and the slope of this function, and this function is what we want to find, is relate, is, has, has the uh, uh, equation equals u, so the function itself, times rho minus u squared, and rho is just a parameter, depending on your application or so. Right? This, this equation comes up in many different uh, 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 areas, like population dynamics, um, um, in, in physics. This is, a very, this is a very generic form of a certain behavior, and I want to show you what behavior this equation is, is going to produce. Okay? This has always to be appended with an initial condition, otherwise we would solve for a family of solutions. And if we put in an initial condition, then we solve for a unique solution. Okay. This has fundamentally different behavior for rho smaller than zero or bigger than zero. And why is that? So for rho smaller than zero, the time derivative, the change in time, can only be zero if this u itself is zero, because if rho is negative, then it cannot make this bracket zero, right? That means when we draw a diagram in time, a graph in time, uh, where here is our u and here is zero, when we start above zero, we will converge to this equilibrium. And we also converge when we start with negative numbers if this makes sense to applications. We find this stable behavior to our equilibrium. And, and if we are at zero, we are not moving in time. We are not moving. This. We are stuck. We are always there. Right? And also, starting at different times somewhere, we will end up here. So that means the only steady state in our system is zero. That's, that's it. Now, when rho is positive, suddenly two new solutions of uh, time change is zero are emerging. Square root rho and minus square root rho. Okay. So now when we are drawing this out, square root rho, u of t, and then here t, we will end up, when we start here, close to this line. When we start below zero, we will end up here, and here, and here. So suddenly, when this parameter changes, and only varies tinyly, because maybe it's around zero, it changes the complete different behavior. Uh, it changes the complete behavior of whatever this describes. Ecosystem collapses. Ecosystem does not collapse, right? And more, right? And this is called... This is called a pitchfork bifurcation. Um, when, we, when I draw here another diagram where I now not continue in time but in this rho parameter, then even he, here at first for negative rho we have only one equilibrium, only one steady state, and then suddenly two new are emerging 
and this one becomes unstable. And this is what you can find out when you do a so-called linear stability analysis. This is done in, in four lines, and, and uh, people in, in math and also in the sciences can, can do this very easily. You can also learn this right, to recover the stability of these steady states. Okay. Now, a partial differential equation is a differential equation involving more than two differentials. Right? So now it's, uh, the function is going to be a function of more than one variable. Again, it has an initial condition, um, and now it needs boundary conditions. Right? Otherwise, you cannot solve for this, for this function. Okay? Now this, this triangle is a second derivative everywhere in space summed. So in 1D, we would have the second derivative uh, uh, only of, of our spatial coordinate and 2D of our, both of our spatial coordinates. And we are now starting with a bump like this. What we already know, what we have already seen with the quadratic, right, that, that the second derivative is 2, which is positive, is that here, when, when we are also like a quadratic, we are positive with the second derivative. It stands on the right-hand side. That means because the diffusion coefficient, this is called the diffusion coefficient, this prefactor, the time change is also positive. So we are moving in time upward here when this is our initial condition. Here the curvature is negative. We are moving down. Here it's positive again. We are moving up. So this has an equilibrating effect on whatever initial condition we give. This is why it's called the diffusion equation, which has been discovered uh, over, over 100 years, uh, and, and, or we have it uh, since 100 years ago. Um, Fick was, was uh, setting it up, and before that Fourier was finding the heat conduction equation, which made it possible for Fick to discover this uh, diffusion equation, which describes the diffusion of heat or of any gas inside a room. If there's no, uh, uh, um, not many other gases there, if there's not a heater standing somewhere which perturbs our situation, our standard situation, right? But that is still a base state of, of other situations. Now, let's go to brown emotion. Maybe you've heard of this. Uh, this is a stochastic process, um, and this is basically a function. This is this wiggly motion I showed you before. Maybe this is the time axis. And now we are starting at a point x at zero, and then each of these increments, so this to this is, is maybe this is t1 and t2, right? These are and then the brown emotion, the value of the brown emotion at T1, value of the brown emotion at T2, this increment, so the second minus the first, is Gaussian distributed. That means, so what, what is a Gaussian distribution? It's again it's looking like this, and that basically means an increment has a probability density function, which I will explain what this means, uh, which looks like this. Here it's zero, and so the, that, that we are with the next increment uh, between these two points has a quite high probability because you, you uh, s sum basically or you integrate from one point to the next to, and compute the, the area between these two points in order to recover how likely it is that our next increment is that number, right? And the chance that our next increment is, is situated between here is, very, is quite low compared to here. That is all that means. That is it. And the expectation is still zero because we are highest, we are symmetric here in this distribution. That is what this means. So this is why this function is also continuous, because we are, we are uh, using this distribution on the increments. And Wiener has proven that this actually exists, this, this object. And uh, this was a fundamental breakthrough, which, which caused 
many other breakthroughs in, in the sciences because the Brown emotion is so important. And once it has been proven mathematically, we could use the definition before in order to recover even more in the Avogadro number, for example. It means the number of the molecules in one mole of, uh, uh, or how many molecules are in one mole of, of a certain um, uh, molecule. Uh, type species, right? Okay. And this is really, it was a long process to recover, uh, uh, to, to get to brown emotion, and it was, was also a long process to get to the mathematical uh, proof that this exists. But why is brown emotion so important, right? This is what you may ask, oh, this is just a mathematical construct, nobody really cares, right? Why should I care? Um, the following two slides are a little bit maybe more, more involved, um, and therefore I only will tell you what, what the takeaways are in, in these uh, slides, right? So first is the central limit theorem, which basically says when you have a sequence of Functions, when you evaluate these functions, they're giving you random numbers, right? This is a sequence of functions evaluated. They give you random numbers with a certain expectation. That means when you average these numbers, you expect that you have the expectation mu as your average. Then the variance is the sigma squared, which is smaller than infinity. And the variance has to be smaller than infinity in order for, for the in order for us to be able to work with with uh, um, this sequence of numbers to recover that the ever, that the that the empirical mean of these of, of these functions which is divided by n how many you have minus the mean of each of them which is different scaled by this factor converges to, again, a normal distributed random variable. Any single process in this world with any single distribution, random distribution, as long as they are probabilistically independent, so they, they don't, uh, uh, are not correlated, they are, they are not changing the probabilistic behavior of the other ones, and have the same probabilistic distribution when you, when you evaluate these events, converge to a Gaussian random variable. Any, anything in this world which is uh, showing the universal behavior of, of this uh, Gaussian distribution. Right? When, when subtracting the mean and then rescaling, right? because this is mean zero. Okay. Now, a, every continuous martingale, and I explain what, what this is, this is basically a fair game, is a time change Brownian motion and nothing else. Right? So a martingale, a discrete time martingale I give here is basically, again, a sequence of these functions evaluated. They have a certain expectation. This has to be bounded. The expectation of the next time step when given that we know the time steps before is only the present time step. It's the present. We expect the present when we go next. That means it could be bigger or smaller with a symmetric um, distribution in the next time step. Okay? That means, so these are kind of involved slides, but that means brown emotion is universal, right? And uh, it describes many phenomena, and even the, the maybe a little bit more dirty phenomena, of, often in molecular biology or in, in uh, bacterial systems, you get uh, a fractional brown emotion, which causes anomalous diffusion, so-called. I don't want to call it anomalous diffusion because maybe our diffusion is not only the standard diffusion, which is brown emotion, but uh, it's subdiffusion or superdiffusion, ballistic behavior, so maybe something spreads out faster or is more dispersive and spreads out slower. This is what we have also sometimes in, in uh, especially in biology, subdiffusive behavior. Okay. Then 
a stochastic differential equation involves the differential of such a stochastic process. We see here a differential of the Brown motion. Again, we have an initial condition even simpler when we don't have this time drift. This is a, an example of a stochastic differential equation where d, I made this choice square root d so that you precisely see how it, what we get for the probability density function. So the probability that we are at a certain point at each single point in time, and this probability density function, the probability that we are at a certain point at each uh, time, evolves, and this is what uh, people in math can easily recover in, in, in six lines of handwriting, according to the diffusion equation. We know this already. So this is now how the circle is closing. So what this means is many, 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 basically infinitely many particles, Brownian particles diffusing. That is the connection to the diffusion equation. Deterministic, stochastic. Okay, now it's quickly time for animations to see this directly. And I computed, I solved the um, SDE. Right? First, I want to show you this. Browser is faster. There we see initially particles were starting here with an initial distribution, which is also a blob structure. And now, by this time, we see this already quite uniformly in space, right? We have here a domain, and here I put reflective boundary conditions on minus 10 to 10, right? So now, these were 50 particles diffusing. And now we can also look at their position in time, and then we see 10, and I zoom into 10 particles, which, is a, which gives us 10 Brownian motions. And they are looking like this. Right. Again, reflective boundary conditions here. And here again, the particles are diffusing in our space, in our little box. But this is a one-dimensional box. You can do the same in two dimensions, three dimensions, four dimensions, whatever. As long as we have the equations, we can do whatever. Right. And we, of course, have to think about how these equations are describing what we want to describe. Here, the fusion of particles. Okay. Now, the heat equation has this solution, which has the same equilibrating effect what I told you about. Right? In time, again, it converges now to a uniform distribution, so the probability to be at every point in space for a single particle is the same everywhere. It's a uniform distribution. First, it was, you're more likely to be here. Now I overlay these two things in order for you to see how this is, oops, how these two descriptions are related to each other. And we see that the probability of every single particle to be at a certain point is related to the mass of particles even, how the mass is diffusing, which is different, right? And now both are equilibrating. Okay. Now, it is very good that we got that far because now I can talk finally about my research. Um, and this will be about um, cell systems which are diffusively coupled with each other. So cells or compartments in which reactions are taking place which are diffusively coupled. In 1952, Alan Turing wanted to describe or wanted to recover how tissues are forming, how embryos are, are forming. So how this process of cell specialization goes on in tissues. And he used for, for recovering this reaction diffusion equations. So where we have, again, our diffusion, we know what this does now, right? And uh, F and G are nonlinear reaction terms producing basically molecules through uh, 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 gene interactions and so on. Okay. Now, with certain boundary conditions, uh, Turing 
recovered in, in, in this paper that you need without diffusion that the uniform state, when all the cells are basically the same, uh, the uniform state has to be stable without diffusion, without this spatial coupling. As soon as diffusion is there, the uniform state has to be unstable because it's destabilized by a certain perturbation. Okay? You don't really have to understand all of this, but we just obtain a perturbation which is existent from this uniform state. Now it's key to, to compute the growth rate of this perturbation. If it's negative, it will die out, it will go to zero, so that it's still stable to be uniform. If this growth, growth rate, the real part of this growth rate is positive, it will grow, 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 and destabilize and produce patterns. This is how you get to this inequality, and here we see in this inequality, so that this is satisfied, that when we are higher with the diffusion rate for the V, where V is taken to be an inhibiting substance, so it inhibits its own production and the production of the activator, U. U activates its own production and the production of the inhibitor, so positive feedback, negative feedback. We need that the inhibitor diffuses on much faster time scales than the activator, because here's a square root, so we can easily satisfy this inequality, causing a perturbation to blow up. Okay, when this is satisfied, we see in our uh, experimental systems and also numerically and uh, so with our computers that patterns are forming out of seemingly nowhere from uniform states. Right. Here at first, the, the top row is for neuronal kinetics, for neurons. The uh, uh, next row is for tissue kinetics, um, Gera-Meinhardt kinetics, and then we have... Uh, chemical pres uh, a model for chemical pattern formation. Okay. This is a problem, though, that we need this diffusion rate uh, ratio to be so high that one of them has to diffuse faster because no normally in biology we see that things are diffusing in extracellular cellular space on similar time scales. So it seems like the math is not really in line what we see realistically. So many people worked on this and tried to fine-tune the kinetics, but nature may not be so fine-tuned. Uh, try to add uh, species everywhere in space, another molecular species reacting, but not everywhere in space there's a species reacting to both of these chemicals. And incorporation of randomness is, is very important, but no one considered the compartmentalization really rigorously. We see everywhere in our organisms compartmentalization into cells where reactions are taking place. This is our approach. So we put the reactions inside compartments, and these are the two species, activating a species, inhibiting species, reacting out to U and V, corresponding species which are diffusively coupling all the cells, reacting back. And now we take the diffusion uh, ratio to be around one, as we see biologically, both are diffusing on the same time scale, and show that the parameter of the reaction rates on this membrane only, only on the membrane of the cells, on the compartments, is, is a bifurcation parameter, is a parameter which causes symmetry breaking. Okay. So this is just the system. I, I don't say too much about, about the system. We solve for the steady states again. So just as I showed you before, um, this nonlinear algebraic equation describes all the equilibria we can possibly have in our system. We choose this very easy setup. This, this is the simplest setup we, we can start with, but we have to start somewhere in order to build up our theory. And so the simplest would be if you just take two cells which are separated, we need this separation still in this model. We hope to, to get rid of it soon. As for tissues, it's more interesting if the cells are closer to each other and touching and really, right. Um, and choose this domain, circle domain, this tissue kinetics here. This is just an example of kinetics. We get this pitchfork bifurcation when we continue in a row. So if the reaction rate ratio is bigger than here, maybe a 10-ish or so, 
we go to an asymmetric state in our system suddenly out of seemingly nowhere. We would not have expected this at all because the asymmetry is not there because everything is super symmetric in our domain. If the radius of the imaginary ring uh, we put the cells on is even decreasing, we get that it's even easier to obtain symmetry breaking. But our asymptotic theory fails because it assumes it needs the separation of cells, so we need a new mathematical theory. We have to construct our cells. Okay? Before this bifurcation point, when we perturb, we still are at the symmetric equilibrium. Both cells are the same. After, starting from this, we see that one cell suddenly is silenced. The other one is upregulated. Okay. Same when we put the cells close together, but our theory fails, but we can anyway simulate it numerically, even though nobody has recovered this yet. Right? We are trying to do precisely this. So, we can now, and now it's key to search for other scenarios where we get that the reaction rate ratio is the bifurcation parameter to cell specialization to symmetry. And uh, putting cells on an infinite lattice, so for, to a certain scale it, it models tissues, right? This is the next step. We are also having strong results, beginning to have strong results here. Okay, from a uniform, every cell is the same base state, okay. then geometric graphs, diffusion on the edges, graphs, networks are again describing, uh, can describe our cells, right? Nodes, maybe cells, maybe the space between cells, we did this already, we also discover that one cell is silenced, the other one is upregulated. When we put more cells there, so basically this, this is infinitely many cells because here are periodic boundary conditions, when you put more cells there, similar patterns are emerging. Involving randomness, cells are involving randomness because every uh, 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 chemical reaction involves randomness, especially in tiny volumes like cells. Randomness becomes important. This is key for the next steps. And here, the, basically, the probability distribution, when it splits into do two different states, so asymmetry, is important to look at. It's a key question. And of course, converging closer and closer and closer to the tissues we see, right? But we have to start somewhere. The theory has not been developed so far. We have to develop it on our own. Okay? So, takeaways from this presentation. If you took not much away, then hopefully you took away what a differential equation is. What is a bifurcation when we vary a parameter? That's something a structure is emerging. What is diffusion? Um, so many brown and particles doing their thing inside the domain, right? Symmetry breaking and cell behavior due to the reaction rate ratio on the membranes. Only because they're in proximity, they feel each other. Right? This is now being in the process of being realized in the sciences that this is of fundamental importance. And uh, there's a, there, there are labs which, which are um, dealing with beads inside which chemical reactions are taking place and which are diffusively coupled again. But these are chemical beads. This is very good for testing our theory because we can precisely control the reaction rates on these bead boundaries, not as for cells, because cells are not 100% understood yet and we cannot really control precisely to the 10 to the minus 16th digit uh, the, the reaction rates and so on, right? Then a very interesting and exciting lab at Caltech and at Cambridge of Magdalena Zernica Götz et al. are producing, uh, 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 yeah, producing embryos out of a few cells inside petri dishes and they also realize that this diffusion coupledness of the cells are uh, of main importance to create embryos, right? In order to make multicellularity emerge in their petri dish. Okay, that was it. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Marley, for yeah, very engaging uh, presentation from the basics to the applied like questions. Uh, it's almost nine, so we'll take maybe one or two questions. Um, yeah. Uh, hi, Marlon. Hey, nice, on. nice talk. I had a question. On one slide, you mentioned that any continuous time martingale is a time changed Brownian motion. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know what time changed Brownian motion is exactly what. A time changed Brownian motion is a Brownian motion when you rescale the, the time dependence on your Brownian motion. So, um, right? You understand? So, so time changed Brownian motion, you, you basically have um, uh, instead of BT, you have B and then quadratic variation of a martingale comma a martingale. So the quadratic variation of a martingale is your time change of your brown in motion. Um, and uh, so you still have the martingale inside the time, but the brown in motion is, is the uh, universal object basically giving you the martingale behavior. Perfect. I can show you. Um, thank you for the talk. Um, I have two small questions. Uh, one is that, um, so I can s see great work around this flows and sorry, like these like, equations on 2D. I was wondering how, like I wonder if you extend your equations to 3D if the computational cost or com um, if there's any mathematical difficulty out there. Um, and the second question is, um, oh, I forgot the second question. So, that, yeah. Yes. To the first question, uh, maybe maybe you you still remember your second question. Uh, the first question: um, things change really in three D, right? So that what changes in three D, we we need a so-called green function to in order to construct the solution, the analytical solution in two D. Uh, the the uh, decaying behavior of the screen function when when going away from the cells, so that we still construct the solution to the concentrations f a little bit more far away from the cells, is very different than than in two D. Um, that means we are going to get some analytical problems, but it's solvable. It, it is solvable, but it needs work in order to to redo our whole theory in a quite different way than we did in, in 2D. So that is uh, why we started at first with 1D networks and 2D, so networks can also describe 3D space or higher dimensional space when, when we maybe take the more variables inside, right? Not only space variables. Um, uh, proving basically that a network gives the same behavior than a 3D uh, system reduces heavily than the cost of the theory, right? But, but we are still on this. So this is after our next, after this lattice project, uh, we are taking a look at um, the uh, network system where the cells are coupled in a network to, in, in certain dimensions. Sure. Uh, Riku, did you remember your second question? Um, so, in my physics background, like usually, like differential, uh, sorry, uh, fluids, uh, fluids or diffusion, those kind of things often are described in the context of like a Navier-Stokes equation. And I was thinking, like, how a, this core conversation like relates to or doesn't relate to Navier-Stokes. Yes. Um, Navier-Stokes, the Navier-Stokes equations are uh, uh, one of the toughest PDE systems, right? We, we can uh, deal with. They're just they're describing so mathematically. They're describing fluid flow. They can describe it in a turbulent regime or in a, in a low Reynolds number, so a not turbulent regime anymore. Um, we are at the moment at tiniest, tiniest, tiniest time scales. So when the Reynolds number is really, really, really small. And the uh, key publication on this where you really experience when you read how it feels to be a bacterium in 
very, very, very long Reynolds number. So a low Reynolds number is caused to you having a tiny, tiny, tiny mass. Um, the bacterium does not feel any inertia anymore. You are weightless, right? And uh, we are considering these regimes at the moment because we are still on this cell level where the cells are so small that we basically, they don't feel their mass anymore. Um, and therefore also their, their behavior is guided not uh, in, in, in terms of uh, trying to overcome inertia or so, but, but there's no inertia. If the bacterium would swim in, 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 some, in water even, uh, like this, if I would be a bacterium, I would be so small so that my mass is so tiny that when I, do this motion, uh, when I do this motion, I would be at this point, but as soon as I'm coming back, I'm at the same point again. So swimming does not work anymore for bacteria and for cells. They have to use a kind of propeller or something else. Um, things get very, very, very different in how you feel at certain scales of your mass and of, of your size. So not in a uh, Navier-Stokes regime. Okay, thank you, Marlene. Uh, I think we should end here. Uh, if you have any lingering questions, I think Marlene might be happy to yeah answer your sure. questions. But thank you for coming tonight. And thank you, Marlene.